Okay. So um, most of you that are here, I think, know about me and my work. Majority of you, I know a lot of you keep coming up to me and talking to me, so I think a lot of you do know my work. But I'm going to have to go back over some of it because uh, before we get into the Nostradamus, I haven't lectured on the Nostradamus for quite a while because I've gone into other things. I've gone into the convoluted universe, you know, the shifting of the earth and the raising of the consciousness into the new earth. That's been my main focus. So I've gotten away from the Nostradamus material. And we were thinking about it. We said, you know, there are a lot of people that probably haven't even heard that about those books and the lectures I did on that. So we said, okay, I'll do that for this one and kind of review all of that. But some of you have probably read the books because they've been out for 20 years. That's a long time. And there's hundreds of thousands of copies that have been sold all over the world, and they're in 20 different languages. So they've been covering a lot of territory. <laughs> so the majority of you have probably already read them, but then other people said they don't even know who Nostradamus is. But uh, the first thing I want to do, though, is go into a little of my background. Uh, you know, people are always asking me, how did you get started in all of this? I said, that's a long story. <laughs> and I usually tell them it was in the first book that I ever wrote was the story of how it all happened. The first book I ever wrote was called Five Lives Remembered. That book has never been published. And the reason why was because it was before its time. And it was a story of how I started out 40 years ago in the 1960s. And it was me and my husband, and we were in the very beginning of hypnosis. That's why when I give my classes and everything, I tell people, I've been at this for 40 years. I know every phase of hypnosis there is because I've done it. But I've seen how it can be, how it has changed, and how everything has evolved. And that's how I developed my own technique, because I saw what was not needed, and I was going to try something new. And that's how I have gotten to what I'm doing now, is by trying and experimenting. But back 40 years ago, was my husband and I were working on this. And he had just come back from Vietnam. And we were stationed down in Texas on a Navy base. He was 21 years in the Navy. So we were stationed down there. And in those days, it was all stop smoking, lose weight. That's the only thing hypnosis was used for. He would never have done anything like what I do now. It was unheard of. The only book out at that time dealing with this was The Search for Bridie Murphy. You remember that. That's a book today that wouldn't even be published. It's too simple, too ordinary. I get hundreds and hundreds of those sessions all the time, and I put them in a box. They would never get published because they were too ordinary. That was a book before its time. It started people thinking about reincarnation and past lives, but it was the first one. It was all that was out. There were no books out to tell a hypnotist how to conduct a session like that, because it just didn't happen. And all we were involved with was just the habits. Well, on the Navy base that we were stationed on, there was a doctor there. He asked my husband and I if we would help this one patient. She was very obese and having kidney problems from overeating. He called, he called it nervous eating. He said, can you at least do the hypnosis on her just to get her to relax? That's all he thought. Maybe that would help, just to get her to relax. And the reason I'm telling all of this is because, maybe I should tell that first, this book is now going to be published. <laughs> it's a long time coming. It was supposed to be here for the conference, but it's still at the printers. And we do have uh, order blanks for it. But we feel it's time. I just thought it was too old, too old-fashioned, passe. But people are always saying, how did you get started? Well, anyway, we were working with the woman just to get her to relax, not knowing anything had happened. And she suddenly goes into a past life. 
for she's in the 1920s and in the roaring 20s in Chicago with the gangsters. And it's like, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> because, uh, you know, this had never happened before. We'd never read about anything like this happening. Didn't know it was even possible. So it's a story of how not knowing what we were doing, and we are using the portable tape recorder of the day, reel to reel, those big ones, you remember that? It was portable. I got it out the other day to get a picture of it for the book, and you can hardly lift it. <laughs> it's the portable ones of the day. That's what we were recording things on. But not knowing what we were doing and what was right, what was wrong, because there were no rules out there. But we had such a curiosity. That's always been my trademark in my work, is my curiosity. I always wanted to know more and know things. Otherwise, we might have got scared, just said, well, I don't know what this is, but it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, she went back into the lifetime where she was in the Roaring Twenties. And so we thought it was interesting. So we start, kept working with that. And incidentally, along the way, her blood pressure dropped. She began losing weight. Her kidneys did come back to normal. But uh, that was a kind of a byproduct then. But as we began doing this, we did it every week, she began going back through one lifetime after another. No guidelines, nothing to tell us what to do. We just kept asking questions. So she went back to five different lifetimes to when she was created by God. And that's why we called the book Five Lives Remembered. And um, we just thought it was fascinating. And the people on the base knew what we were doing, and they'd come over to the house to listen to the latest chapter. And we didn't tell anyone who the woman was. We were trying to protect her identity because on a Navy base, it's like a small town. And we didn't let anyone know what book she was, but they were so exciting because nobody was thinking like this. You gotta remember the words reincarnation, new age, hypnosis, past life regression, those words hadn't even been coined yet. They were not even invented. We were way ahead of our times. The only ones who would have been into that would have been religious people. But nobody at that time knew anything about it. There were no New Age stores. They hadn't even come along. There were no books on reincarnation, no books on past life regression. So it's what I mean. This was totally new, and the people who came to hear it, it was blowing everybody away. They had to start changing their belief system and making them think in a new direction. But this is amazing. Now I know she was a synambulist. And that's where I work now, in the synambulistic level. <clears throat> the synambulistic level is the deepest possible level of trance. <clears throat> when they go into that level, they don't remember anything. They become the other personality totally. And I love working like that, because me, it's time travel. You go back into a past life, and they become the other person, they don't remember anything dealing with this life at all. You were to bring up something that occurred in this life, they don't even know what you're talking about. And if you read my Jesus books, you know what I mean. I call it time travel, travel. and to me it is so exciting to be able to do that. But can you imagine the first time it ever happens to you out of the blue? She's a somnambulist, and here she's this sexy flapper in the 1920s. And we're sitting there, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> and then she, one of her lives, she was in the Civil War, um, a Southern Belle on a plantation. I mean, this was all very exciting. So we, people would come over and they'd listen to this. And we spent months working on this. And we started experimenting. Well, we can do this. What else can we do? Then we began, we even went into the future just to see what we were going to be doing. The curiosity is out there, why not? And we even started exploring events. And one of them, we had her go to the Kennedy assassination, which in those days it only happened a few years before, and tell us what was happening at that time. She saw it, everything that happened, and she reported it being he was killed with a crossfire. 
And here we're sitting there, what? Because that was not what the Warren Commission had said at that time, with the conclusions they'd come to. So we were experimenting and doing all kinds of things nobody had ever heard of. And then it was just like, well, what can we do next? Because it was so exciting. Now, the book is all about all of these things we went through. The amazing thing is, everything we found in that life has not been discredited now. We had walk-ins before there were, the term was even formed. You know, Ruth Montgomery didn't come up with the term walk-ins until the 1970s. And in that fooling around an experiment, we had walk-ins. So if you imagine what this is like if you've never heard of it before. So anyhow, this went on for several months, and it was exciting. Then it all came to a abrupt, crashing, terrorizing halt because my husband was on his way to the base one night and he was almost killed. He was uh, hit by a drunk driver and he had a Volkswagen bus and nothing in front of you, a head-on collision on the way to the, to the base and he was ground into the metal. His body was completely crushed and the doctors, at that time, they had the helicopters there. They didn't have the jaws of life. They were going to amputate his legs to get him out of the car. It was a really horrible experience. And they ended up, they got him out. The only way his life was saved was because the car in back of us, of him, there was a corpsman that had just returned from Vietnam, and he knew how to handle trauma, and he was able to get to him. But he lost all the blood in his body. His body was completely crushed. Uh, his face was torn apart. I mean, it was, they, when they got there with the helicopter and finally hooked the fire truck to one end of the car and the other car to the other to pry it apart to get him out. And when they got him in the helicopter, he'd lost all the blood in his body. And they said, there's no way this man can live. And even his heart stopped three times during all of this. And they said, if he does live, he's going to be a vegetable. So you can imagine what this was on me. <laughs> but um, I know when I got to the hospital that night, and the doctors were all coming in telling me, five doctors, one after the other, saying there's no way this man can live. It's too much trauma, too much damage. And I kept telling them, no, you don't know. Because when we were doing that experimenting, we had her see the future. And she saw us living where we are now in the country out here in Arkansas. She didn't say Arkansas, she saw it was in the country. Saw us with grandchildren. And my oldest daughter was only 15 at that time. And it was like she saw us in the future. And I believed that because this was so fascinating, I knew it had to be true. So when the doctors were coming in and telling me he couldn't possibly live during the night, I said, no, he is. I couldn't tell them how I knew, but I knew they were wrong. And finally they said, well, if you're that sure about it, maybe he'll have a chance. So during the time, it was all, he was in and out of a consciousness, in and out of a coma for a long time, and all kinds of miracles began happening. His face went back together without any plastic surgery. They began calling him the miracle man. All kinds of things happened that could not possibly have happened. They didn't have to amputate. They put him in a body cast, and he was in that body cast for eight months. He spent a year in the hospital. But when they saw he was finally going to live, and they were just completely astounded, they said, then they better start putting him back together. So anyway, during all of this was going on, the people on the base began saying, this is your punishment. Fooling around with something you're not supposed to be fooling around with. Reincarnation, for goodness sakes. You know, you're not supposed to do those things. You're asking questions. You're peeking around hidden corners, opening up hidden doors. And they were all saying, this is your punishment for doing those things. I couldn't believe that. Because when we were taking her back through the five lives, she went back to where she was created by God. 
And we found a God that was so loving, I knew he couldn't punish somebody for asking questions and wanting to know more. So I knew that couldn't be the truth. But we went through a very bad time there anyway. And he spent a year in the hospital. And when he was finally put out, we moved up here to Arkansas. And he spent 25 years in a wheelchair. But he made his life on his own. He went into a black block depression because his life was over. And we had a very hard time. But the book tells the story of how all of this happened. And I wrote the book, oh, 35 years ago, right after all the incidents and what happened. And I tried to get it published. It was ahead of its time. Nobody knew anything about reincarnation. They didn't know about past lives. So I went through years of having the rejection come back. I said, I know what it's like to be an author. I've had absolutely every disappointment and heartbreak that can happen to an author has happened to me. I've been there, done that. So as all of these things kept coming back, I finally gave up. I said, well, it's not going to be published. There was no age, no New Age bookstores. I think the bookstores had one little shelf for anything metaphysical. That's how far ahead we were of our time. So I said, all right, I'll just put it aside. That didn't mean I stopped um, writing, because when we moved to Arkansas, after the kids began growing up, they began going up to get married and going to college, it was like, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? I wanted to get back into that, because that was so fascinating to be able to go in time and relive all of these things that were happening. So I knew there had to be other ways of doing the hypnosis, because in the ways we were doing it in those days, it was the old-fashioned way. Watch the shiny object and all of that, you know, and the testing and the long drought on inductions. And I knew there had to be easier ways. So I began to study the other methods. And then I found that the new methods were done with visualization and imagery. So that was what I began doing. And I wanted to do the past life regressions. And people were coming to me here in the hills of Arkansas. Over at Huntsville, there's only 2,000 people. But they were coming, and I began doing the past lives. And immediately, I was having synambulists, which are the deepest trans subjects. They became, became the other people. The first ones that came to me were the Jesus material. Now, the odds on this stuff is happening is really very slim. But that's why I said I didn't stop writing. I put the other book aside. I began doing this kind of research, gathering material, and I started writing other books. Now, the other books have all been printed over the years. The Jesus material, the Nostradamus material, all my books on UFOs, on life after death. I've got 15 books out now that I've done. And every time I get a lecture, they say, well, why don't you print that book about how it started? I said, oh, it's too old now. It's too uh, passe. I've come so far. I've done so much since then that it's, it, it doesn't seem right to come out with it now. So I kept putting it off. Well, it was only, <laughs> she, she kept telling me, my daughter kept saying, you know, you really need to publish that book. And I said, oh, I don't know. It's too old now. So it was a few months ago, I'm doing some remodeling in my house, and I was in my office, and I started cleaning out all these old filing cabinets. There I came across the original manuscript, and I'm holding it there, and it's like it's talking to me, saying, I think it's time. So <laughs> after 40 years, <laughs> so I gave it to my daughter, and I said, here, you read it. You tell me what you think. Is it? Passe, you know, is it uh, too old? Because I have come a long way since then. You know, the metaphysical stuff I'm into now, I'm learning more and more and more stuff. So she went and read it, and she cried most of the way through it. But, but 
She told me, she said, Mom, this book has to be published. You said it's a bridge book, didn't you? That, will you tell them what, what, you, what you said? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, well, she said it was a bridge book because there are a lot of people out there now who don't know the basics. That's one thing. But also, it's to show how far you can come. She was thinking it needed to be required reading in my classes now to show what you can do and not even having a clue what you were doing <laughs> and what you could accomplish with it. And it's like a time capsule also, she said, because it is the 60s and the way things were in those days, the belief system, all of it. Well, anyway, she said, it's got to come out. So then I took it and read it and I said, well, you know, it is a good book. And there are people out there who were just beginning and just starting these things. So the only thing I had to do was write an introduction explaining why it was so long coming. And then we sent it to the printers. And we were hoping to have it here in time for this. But it's, it'll be a few days when it, before it gets out. OK. <laughs> Monday, we'll be out of here by that time. Anyway, we do have order blanks on it, and some people say they want everything I've written anyway. And this is the beginning of how I started out on this long, long journey that's taken me 40 years to get to this point. So if anybody's interested, we do have the order blanks, and we'll fill them as soon as the book gets here. But it's five lives remembered. So then I won't have any excuses anymore then, but you know, I'm still writing more books. There's still more coming. Okay, but, well, anyway. But anyway, it shows nothing is ever easy. You know, if you, you start on a path, you better make sure that's what you want to do. That's why I didn't find my, publish, my first publisher for nine years. It took me nine years to find the first publisher. I call that my testing time. They were testing me, like, okay, you can back out if you want. You got a chance, you can back out. Once you're committed, there's no backing out. And that's what it was like until finally I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I want to do this. And the minute I made that commitment, everything began to happen. And I found my first publisher right after that. I just sat one night, I said, okay, it's yours. You do whatever you want to do with it. I'm tired of sending it out and having it come back and rejections. But the minute I made that commitment and said, I'm, I'm going to do this, then everything began happening. So there's no way out now. <laughs> but the first books came out in 1989. The first ones to be published were the Nostradamus material. They weren't the first ones I wrote, but they were the first ones to come out. So I'm going to tell you about the Nostradamus material anyway, because by that time I had already written the Jesus books. Uh, I think I'd written Keepers of the Garden and Between Death and Life. And then I got involved in the Nostradamus material at the same time that I became a UFO investigator, because I've been doing that for 20 years, working on UFO cases and ETs. So now I'm into all of it. I ended up writing four books about the UFOs. But the Nostradamus material happened at the same time I was working on the beginning of the UFO investigations. Well, by this time, I don't think anything could surprise me. <laughs> we had all these years of working on this. But the Nostradamus material was very strange. I didn't go looking for it. I don't think anybody could. But I had a woman. She just wanted to go into some past lives. She didn't really know anything about metaphysics. I call her an ordinary woman because she had 10 children. One of them was uh, deaf and mute, and she had never finished high school. She dropped out of high school to take care of this large family. She had two jobs. So it's not the kind of person you would think had time to sit down and say, well, let's think of a hoax to fool the world. And that's what I have been accused of. I've been accused of everything you can think of. 
But there's, they say, oh, you're a really good fiction writer. <laughs> I couldn't begin to make up these things I write about. But this was a woman who would, had no idea what was going on. I had a past life with her. She goes back to a past life where she was a student of Nostradamus in the 1500s in France. She didn't even know later who Nostradamus was. She couldn't even pronounce his name. I knew who he was, but I'd never studied the prophecies. Now they're saying I'm the world's foremost expert on the Nostradamus prophecies. But when I started out, I didn't know anything more than anybody in this room. But, um, you know, you probably know who he is. Sometimes I get people who don't know who he is. He was the most famous psychic that ever lived, and he lived in the 1500s in France, and he wrote almost 1,000 quatrains. And the quatrains are four-line poems, but that also they're four-line puzzles in the case of Nostradamus, a prophecy or a puzzle. And he wrote them in uh, the most amazing language. People have been studying them for over 400 years trying to figure out what they mean. When I started lecturing on this, I had one man that told me he'd spent four years on one of the prophecies, trying to figure it out. Because Nostradamus used uh, anagrams, he used symbolism, he used many other languages, he used made-up words, and so they're very difficult to understand, and there's almost 1,000 of them. And this is the first time all of them have ever been interpreted. There's books out there that tell you what the words mean and the cities and things, but they don't tell you what the prophecy means. But I didn't know any of this when I started out with this. So the woman goes back to where she is a student of Nostradamus in France, and I was thinking, well, maybe she could tell me something about this great man, and maybe it'd make an interesting chapter in a book of miscellaneous regressions down the road. <laughs> That book of miscellaneous regressions turned into a three-volume set. But she began telling me about Nostradamus, so she was a student. And at that time, I didn't know that he had students, but they were studying with him in secret because at that time, they would have been killed. He would have been killed if he knew what he was predicting the future. He said he would have either been killed or he would have had his land taken away and put in prison. So it was a dangerous time to live. So he had students coming to his house and they were pretending to be studying medicine with him because Nostradamus was a very famous physician. He would have been remembered as a doctor if even people had forgot all about the prophecies. But he, was he said he was teaching them medicine. Actually, he was teaching them metaphysics and teaching them to see the future the same way that he did. So that was what he were teaching. So this young man, the woman who was the student in the past life, was one that was studying with him. <coughs> so as we were talking about him, that's when everything got very strange. Because all of a sudden, as she's talking to him, she said, he wants to speak to you. I said, what? What are you talking about? He wants to speak to you. And he, apparently he knew his, what his student was doing. And so, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. What she did, she put her hand up to keep me quiet, and she would listen to what he was saying. Then she would repeat to me what he was saying, like she was in the middle. So it's not really channeling. She was back and forth answering the questions. And she would repeat it back and forth. He's saying this, and he's telling you this. And he said he's been looking for a link to the future because he could see that his prophecies were not being correctly interpreted. And the time is coming when they're going to come true. And he was very worried that we were not going to get the information in time. So he said, I have an assignment for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was in there, what? <laughs> he said, I know, I see there's a book in your time that has my prophecies in them. They've come down to your time. 
I want you to get that book and I want you to read them to me one by one and I will tell you what they mean, what the prophecy means, what time period it belongs to. And he said, I was supposed to write it and get it into our language of our time so the people could be warmed in time. And I was thinking, oh, gee, you know, thanks. <laughs> because uh, who would have, have thought something like that? Anyway, when the woman woke up, because when they're in this level, they don't remember anything. The woman woke up, and I told her what had just happened and what she was supposed to do. She was so frightened, she moved to Alaska. So you can't say, I started it. You can't say, she started it. She didn't want any part of it. She was from Alaska, and I think she decided it was time to go home. <laughs> she wanted to put as much distance between me and her as she could. So, but anyway, we had time for one more session. She did agree to that before she was going to leave. And I think it was just more to appease me than anything else. So we had it in her house, and they were had been moving the furniture. There were packing boxes all over the place, and they were going to have a going away dinner for her. She said, "I got one hour, and that's all I can do. It's just to make me feel better." So we had the session again, and it happened again. He came through again, and he said, "You must do this work. It is very, very important to your time." I said, I can't. She's moving away. He said, that doesn't matter. Now that we have made this connection, you will never lose me. I will come through anybody you work with. That's a big statement because I worked with a lot of people. And he said, he gave me the instructions on how to locate him and tests to perform so I would know it was actually him that I was speaking to each time. And... Then the woman moved away. And it's like, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> so it was a couple of months. And during that time, I wrote the first four chapters of the first volume of Conversations with Nostradamus, not knowing if it was going anywhere. I wanted to write it while it was fresh in my mind. And I thought nothing else, it just may go into a drawer somewhere. But I wrote the first four chapters. Then I decided I had a young college student. She was a music major in the organ, and she was an excellent subject. I've been doing a lot of experimenting with her with remote viewing and time travel. So I thought, well, that would be a good one to try this on, just to see if it could happen by following his instructions. So I never told her what I was going to do. We always did experiments. So I went to her house, and I said, do you want to try an experiment? She said, yeah, it's okay. Just tell me what it's all about when it's over. So I followed his instructions, not knowing what was going to happen. There he was, the same man in the same room. Incidentally, this is done with a mirror. He has a black obsidian mirror that I found he, could, he would go into trance and stare at the mirror, and he would go out of his body and see all of these things. And he told us later that when he'd come back into his body, he would find he had written the prophecies, the four lines, by automatic writing. That was how it was done. And I just did a filming for the History Channel a few months ago, and they wanted to know the process and all of this. So I was explaining how all this was done. But anyway, um, here he was, the same man in the same room with the mirror, and he said, oh, you're here. Now we can continue. Now we can get down to work. Of course, I was too dumbfounded that first time. I said, well, we did it. To th I think of doing the, the prophecies. I just began asking him a lot of questions about his life and everything. But that started out. The whole volume one is my work with Elena, was the one that went to Alaska, and then Brenda. And during that time, I got the book. I didn't know what I was reading. I would open the book anywhere it happened to be, and I would read the quatrain, the prophecy, and then I would check it off. And we'd go to another one, not knowing what I was doing. 
In the first book, we ended up doing about 300 of the prophecies in six weeks' time, only seeing her once a week. That's a lot, especially when you're working with something as complicated as this. There was no thinking at all. She would just automatically tell me what they meant. But there were a lot of times he would tell us that's not correct translation. Something's wrong here. It's not been done right. And first he would say, read it in French. <laughs> then, I don't know French. <laughs> and the girl didn't know French either. I said, that don't matter. You don't speak French the way I do anyway. But <laughs> he said, if you can keep the vowels and the consonants pure, maybe I would understand it without you butchering it too much. But I didn't want to do it unless I really had to. And he would say, well, read it. I don't know what it is. And <laughs> but it was so funny. But there were times whenever we were doing it that way, and there were people in the room observing, and we had one man one time who understood French, and he said, he is correcting you in old French, not modern French. There was so much in this whole thing that was just beyond belief. But anyway, through her, we ended up doing 300, and he said, don't worry about the ones that happened in the past. They'll only be interesting to people who are interested in history. Concentrate on now, it was in the 80s, and the next 20 years. That there's going to be more things happening in the next 20 years than have happened in the last 100 years. This is going to be a very important, powerful time you're living in. So he said, focus on that. And it was my job here. I'm reading these things. I don't have no idea what time period they belong in or anything. I have thousands and thousands of pages of transcript. You imagine this was not just this one. It gets more complicated. <laughs> but um, I had to transcribe all of that. I had to put it in some kind of order, some kind of chronological order. Now, he said many times, it's very difficult to put a time, a date on anything. You know, any psychic, it's very difficult for any of them to put a date on something. Because how do they know? He said the only way he could tell a date was if he could see a part of the sky and he could make out constellations. Then he might have an idea of some kind of a time frame. Otherwise, everything looked futuristic to him. He has no way of knowing. What it's, it's all way ahead of his time. So there was no way to really date anything. And he said it doesn't matter because he explained there are nexus points. And a nexus point is an event or a personality that must happen. That is central. But from that nexus point, time branches out in many probabilities and possibilities. So we said the future is never set in stone. It can always be changed. It's malleable. This is why it's very hard to tell the future, especially imagine 400 years ahead of his time, because there's too many things that can happen that can change the event that he saw. But of these probabilities and possibilities, there is every possible outcome from the worst to the least of the event. And this is what he told me. He said, this time frame right now is so important. He said, if I tell you the most horrible things man can do to himself, will you do something to correct it? That's what he wanted us to know. People say he's doom and gloom. He said, I'm telling you the worst possible scenarios, the worst possible result of what I see. It doesn't mean that's the only result, but he wanted us to know that to shake us up. He said, I've got to get your attention. He said, otherwise, you're not going to listen to me. So he told us the most horrible things that he saw. Well, anyway, this went on for about six months. I was working with Brenda. And she come to a point where she couldn't work with me anymore. That uh, she was in college and she had to drop out. She had money problems. And so she goes to work in the local chicken plant. 
And those of you who live in Arkansas, you know what the chicken plants are around here. It's not a good place to work. And here she's a musician, and her hands was, was really hurting her to work in that ice cold water with the chickens and everything. So it was miserable. So I would go to her house, and she had just got off of work late at night, and she said, I can't work. She said, all I want to do is just go to bed. I don't even want to eat anything. She said, I'm just so miserable. So I was thinking, well, this looks like this is the end of our work. Now, when we were working with Brenda, <coughs> he kept telling me, Nostradamus kept saying, you're going to need a drawer of horoscopes, an astrologer, a drawer of horoscopes, because we're going to get into astrological dating. That was the only way he could date something. And I didn't know astrology. Brenda didn't know astrology. So he said he tried to do some of this, and she couldn't figure it out because she didn't have the background in her mind. He said, you're going to need a drawer of horoscopes. But he said, you will find who you need. Within a week, I was at a metaphysical meeting. This young man, John, walks in. And he said, you know, I don't have any idea why I'm here, but I had to be here for some reason. So when he found out what I was working on with the Nostradamus material, he told me he was an astrologer and had always been fascinated by Nostradamus. Now, where could you find somebody like that in Arkansas, anyway? <laughs> so he thought it was fascinating. He wanted to sit in on some of the sessions. And so he'd sit there with his ephemeris, looking up the dates and things, and trying to communicate with him about the dates. Well, anyway, when Brenda said she couldn't work anymore, I go to John and I tell him, this looks like to me this is the end of our story. We can't go any further. She can't work. And I said, I'm not going to force anybody to work. I don't work that way. But I said, looks like it's the end of it. And he said, why don't you put me under and see if I can contact him and I can communicate as one astrologer to another. And I said, oh, yeah, I've done the impossible three times. You want me to do it again? And he said, yeah, why not? And I said, can't you just hear the skeptics? He said, I don't care what they say. He said, I want to finish this because we have been getting into the information on the Antichrist. We were getting dates on the shift of the world. We were getting into some very important things. He said, I must finish this. He, I didn't know at that time he was getting ready to move to Florida. People were always moving in and out of this whole project. So when he, uh, he said, I said, well, I can try it, but I don't know what's going to happen. So I put him under. He goes and finds Nostradamus, the same room. With him, he went through the mirror. And most, it was in the room with Nostradamus walking around with him as a spirit form. And Nostradamus would pull charts off of the shelves and lay them out for him to look at, and he would explain astrological dating. In return, uh, John taught him about Neptune and planets in Uranus that he didn't have at his time. He thought it was a very strange. <laughs> That's when I found out a lot of the things that he, he did in his day, he had medical uh, things that he did that were way ahead of his time. He got them from observing our time. Everybody said, well, he's a miracle man. How can he come up with all these cures and things? He observed our time, and that's how he found out these things. So this is why it's so fascinating to be with him. And here, the, the two time cultures and everything. And he didn't like women. He was definitely a male chauvinist. But in his day, women weren't educated. They weren't worth anything. He said the only thing they're worth for is fetch this, fetch that, and have children because they weren't uh, educated. He said the only woman he ever met that was worth even talking to was Catherine de Medici, the queen of France. And he said she should have been born a man because she was intelligent. So he was a little upset by the time we got into the second volume and he found out I was a woman. <laughs> he said he'd always perceived me as an energy. 
said, all right, I'll just think of you as a future woman. We won't worry about it. But anyway, it's turned out to be volume two of the Conversations with Nostradamus was John's work and with the astrological dating and what he found. And we were able to get the maps for the shift of the world. We got a lot of information about the Antichrist. We did uh, an extreme amount of work during that time. One thing that was fascinating is John had always had this affinity for astrology. He just did it immediately, and you couldn't ever figure out how he got, on, got into it so easily. I did a past life on him. He went back to his last life before this one. He was in Germany during the time of Nazi Germany with Hitler. And Hitler at that time, during the Second World War, was calling in psychics and astrologers to help with the Second World War. If any of you know about that or not, I found it all to be true. So one of the things he was doing, he wanted to, have to translate the Nostradamus prophecies to reflect that, that Germany was winning the war. So John was an astrologer during that time. So he was recruited to work for Hitler in the translation, and he wanted them to corrupt the quatrains, corrupt prophecies to reflect that Germany was going to win the war. And then they made these into leaflets, and they dropped them all over the different countries they were conquering. I found out all of this really did happen. But uh, he ended up dying in that war because it was in that lifetime, uh, being shot because he wouldn't go along with what was happening. But to me, it was like karma coming around. Because in that lifetime, he was helping the second Antichrist, Hitler. In this lifetime, he was helping to defeat the third Antichrist by making the prophecies correct where before he had corrupted them. See how karma comes around. It's amazing, these little pieces that all fit together. So anyway, we worked with John about six weeks, and he kept saying he was going to move to Florida and was trying to get all of the astrological stuff done that I could possibly get done before he leaves. So finally he goes. He goes to Florida, and after he was there, I wanted to make sure everything was accurate, and I kept sending him the the, the manuscript and the parts about the astrology to make sure it was correct. And finally he told me it doesn't make any difference because he said, I'm dying. And a lot of people, since the books have come out, wanted me to put him in touch with John so he could do their charts. What happened, after he was only there about a year and he died of AIDS, and he was only 36 years old, and he was in the nursing home when he died, and so I dedicated the second book to John. And I said to him that, and they told me on the wall by his bed, he had the dedication taped to the bed, to the wall. To him, it was one of the most satisfying things he had done in his life to be associated with this project. Maybe that was all he was supposed to do. Maybe that was why he had to leave so young. Who's to say there's so much weird things that happened with this whole thing? But he did die at 36 of AIDS. So that was the second volume, dealt with the dating and the, pro the prophecies. After that, I thought, well, surely I'm done. Those were the first two books that were uh, published. But I had about 400 other prophecies that had never been translated. I I'm, want I'm to finish what I start. <laughs> So I thought, well, let's see what we can find. So I began, I said, let me try this on all of my subjects that I knew could go into deep trance. So I began to, going to their houses, and I never told any of them what I was working on. I just said, we're just going to try an experiment. So ended up, before we were done, with all of this from beginning to end, with 12 different people. So if you had just one, there's always a chance of hoax. There's always a chance of something not being right. But when you've got 12 people involved, 
they are all saying the same thing. They're all seeing the same man in the same room working with the same mirror. They are all repeating the same scenario of what's going to happen to the earth. It's got to be some truth in it because none of them knew what I'd found. They didn't know what I was working on. So I ended up writing volume three. And volume three was finishing up all of it with the, all the other people that I could find. So it's, it's quite a fascinating story, but here we have a thousand prophecies. There's no way you could put them all into one book. It's impossible. But he told me, focus on the, the time now, not the past. I put some of them in the books about the past because I wanted to show his remarkable use of symbolism and how they, you can figure out what he meant. But down through the ages, people can only figure that out after it happens, not before. But here we were getting it all, and it's wonderful the way his mind works. He uses a lot of Greek mythology and Greek history. To him, he said, I'm appalled at your lack of education. <laughs> he said, in his day, to know Greek history and Greek mythology was a sign of a well-educated man. And he said, you don't even teach it anymore. He said, in the generation before you, it was required teaching. Now, I had some in school. You know, we had the Iliad and the Odyssey, and that's about it. I don't know if they even teach that nowadays in the high school now, as they still teach uh, even that much. And we knew some of the gods and the goddesses. But to him, that was a mark of, well ed of an educated man, and that was what they focused on. So in the prophecies, he would use this. But that way, the Inquisition wouldn't know what he was talking about. They wouldn't know the comparisons he was trying to make. So the like different events in history, he would tell me, you go look up what that is, and you'll see the comparison I'm trying to make. One that I do like to say is, the, in one prophecy, he uses the words Mycia, Lycia, and Pamphylia. It sounds like gobbledygook. But he said, those are names for ancient Greek uh, countries and cities. You look up and see what they're called today, and you'll see the part of the world that I'm referring to. Can you figure out what part of the world it is? The Middle East. They're the uh, names for the countries around the Mediterranean and the, uh, oh, the Dead Sea, and those, all those areas now where Iran, Iraq, and all of those are. Now, who would know those things until you know, somebody's really telling you who wrote that? And that's the kind of thing that kept coming up. And all kinds of legends that he made comparisons to people in our time, leaders in our time, and different events. And it all went along with the way his mind was working. When he would mention Hermes, our Mercury, the gods, he was referring to communication. Anything dealing with communication. When he would talk about Vulcan, the god, he was referring to war because the fires had to be that hot to make weapons. And the Vestal Virgins were the, talking about the atomic bomb, because they were the virgins who tended the eternal fire. See how his mind is very complex. That's why nobody in 400 years could figure out what he was saying, because they couldn't understand the way his mind worked in that time period. And even when I was on the uh, filming for the History Channel, they said, we don't understand his use of anagrams because it didn't follow the rules. I said, that's because you don't know how he was writing. In his time period in, in France, anagrams was a big pastime. And they loved making them as complicated as they could. So they changed the rules that are normally done with anagrams. And that's what he had in the puzzles. And uh, that's what I told him when we did the filming. I said, he's not using the, the rules we use nowadays. But see, that is fascinating. You see my curiosity where all this was going. So anyway, through all of these people, we finally got the whole story of the scenario of what is, what's going to happen to the Earth. 
Now, many of these prophecies have come true. The books came out in 1989. They've been reprinted, oh, I don't know, 10, 20 times anyway. There have to be hundreds of thousands of copies they've been reprinted. What I'm working on now, I'm thinking of trying to condense them down into one volume. That's going to be a big job. They've been working on it. What do you pick out to throw away? <laughs> Even when I was writing volume three, and I'd say, well, should I leave this in or not? I decided to take it out, and here it would come true. So it's hard to pick what to choose. So it ended up that um, I thought, well, let's condense it down. <coughs> a lot of the things have come true. But I'm seeing a strange trend here happening because he did say the worst possible scenarios. According to his scenarios, by the end of the 1990s and beginning of the 2000s, we should have been in a full-fledged war in the Middle East with the Antichrist, and it would have been the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to the world. Well, what he told me to do, he said my job was to get the books published and to go and lecture all over the world. He said, you've got to tell people how they can use their minds to keep these things from happening. Did you don't know the power of your own mind. If you focus on anything, it's the law of attraction. You bring it to you. But he said, if I show you the most horrible things you can do to yourself, the worst case scenario, and you focus on the opposite, that can be your reality. He wanted us to focus on peace and love and keep these things from happening. But he said, if one person's mind is that powerful, imagine the power of group mind. Did you have to go to groups of people? If you can get groups focusing on the opposite of what he saw. He said, group mind is so powerful, it's not only multiplied, it's squared. The power is tremendous. So I was, after the books came out, I mean, I traveled all over the world. I would lecture all day long. Sometimes I'd lecture for a week, every day on a different part of the prophecies. And that was my job, was to tell people, if you have metaphysical groups, if you have prayer groups, any kind of a group that would meet regularly, if you can go back and just take five minutes out of that time to focus on the opposite, of what he was predicting, we can keep these things from happening, and we can perform a miracle. And that's what he told me to do. And I was doing that for many years, all through the, the 90s, really. I think I stopped lecturing on it toward the end of the 90s. But during that time, a lot of these things did come true. And then now, the worst isn't. So I'm going to be playing a video, and I want you to, to show you what going on here with that, uh, because I'm coming up to all kinds of conclusions. But first, I do want to tell about some of the ones that have come true. People for years have been saying, I'm sitting here reading these books and watching it happen on television. That's how up to date it all is. Um, the 2000 election, remember that election, Bush and Gore, was in there in the minutest detail. Ever since the book came out, people kept calling me every time there was going to be an election. This is before the days of internet. <laughs> and they would say, is this going to be the year of the hung jury election? I said, I don't know. All I know is what you got in the books. Because he saw an election that was what he called the hung jury election, as though it's so close you can't make a decision. And, oh, I, I probably should have brought it to read it because there's, there's such tricky symbolism. Nobody in all the, the, the scholars who have studied the prophecies have never come up with an, an answer like this. In the prophecy, it talks about uh, the bones of the dead, and they come up with it, somebody, a ghost or something like that. 
and our Sarhadid Cemetery. And that's not anywhere near. It's his symbolism. So nobody has ever come up with the answers that we came up with. He said it would be an election, and it would be at a time when there would be a lot going on in the world where it would be very important to be at a time of war. And this could be a very important election, but he said it would be so close that nobody could find the winner, and even the Congressional Congress would not be able to come up with a winner. And this is a whole page of this prediction. And some of you have read the book, so you know what I'm talking about, don't you? The ones who have read that prediction. And he said in there an interesting thing. He said it would come so close that it might even cause a civil war, because everybody would be rooting for their candidate and to be very angry about it. And he said the only way a decision would be made would be uh, after another election had occurred. Well, I think he saw all this counting of the ballots over and over again, and that's what he meant. But anyway, that one prophecy is extreme detail. And also, Bush was not supposed to win. He was not supposed to win. Gore was supposed to win. Can you imagine the difference in the last eight years if uh, Gore had got in there with his focus on ecology and the environment? What a difference the world would have been. But it was not supposed to be that way. Bush is predicted many times in the prophecy. And who would have known there was going to be two? Because some of the prophecies apply to the first one, and some of them apply to the second one. <laughs> he doesn't say the name, but it's definitely this time period. And he talks about the wars in Iraq. All of that is in there. He also talked about the Monica Lewinsky scandal, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> but uh, so some of these, you never know what's going to be in there. And it's only when it's happening you say, oh, that's what he's talking about. But um, the uh, another one that did happen was the 9-11. And it's, it's funny, I was lecturing the night before the 9-11 happened. It was in North Carolina. I'd been there for some conferences, and I had one last talk at this little center with a small group before I was going to leave the next morning. And we're staying at this person's house <coughs> overnight. That night, <laughs> during the lecture, I was talking about the prophecies that dealt with that. Because in one of the prophecies, he definitely mentions the bombing of the Pentagon. And he says Pentagon in the prophecy. We were talking about this during the lecture. And the next morning, we get up and here's showing on TV, you know, with the bombing of the World Trade Center and all of that. An interesting thing about the prophecy about the Pentagon, you've probably been hearing all this uh, controversies, conspiracy stuff that's on, been on emails and TV, is he says a bomb will fall on the, on the Pentagon. He never called it a plane or anything. And you know, there's a controversy about that. Was it ever, even a plane? Because the videos don't show a plane. Who's to say he said it was a bomb in the Pentagon. Well, there'd be a lot of this, so I don't know if we're ever going to know the answers to. <laughs> but he did mention 9-11. <laughs> he didn't mention the date, but he talked about hitting New York. And he said, it's hard to say what's going to happen, because he said, this is going to be the first of many. There will be many attacks on New York after that. So it was hard to separate them out. But all of these things were definitely in the prophecies that were happening. Um, there's so many, but those are the main ones that I've had. We try to keep up with it, didn't we? For a while, we had it on the website, the ones that were the update. And every time I would reprint the books, I would add to the back of volume one some updates. But it just got to be impossible to keep up with all of it. Then it was hard to do it on the website. So anyway, it just kept going and going. So um, a lot of what he focused on was the third Antichrist. He said there were three Antichrists. And I'm going to play a video, and a lot of this information will be in there. Because he said he didn't like the term Antichrist. He said it sounded religious. 
But he said, if you refer to Christ as humanity, that an antichrist was someone who did something against humanity, a person who had no morals, and like he said, Genghis Khan or Attila the Hun, said, actually, if you want to consider that, you could say there were five antichrists, because he considered Attila the Hun and um, Genghis Khan is also this kind of a personality. So he said, if somebody like that, so the three antichrists that he saw was Napoleon for his time period in um, France. And he has lots and lots of quatrains dealing with Napoleon and, and also Hitler. And we had many, many of those. And when I was on the History Channel, they wanted me to name off these. because I don't know what they're going to put in this, this uh, program. For a while during the 1990s, I was on every show dealing with Nostradamus, every network, every documentary. There's so many out there. And now they're not calling on me as much because it's kind of fading away. But you know, over the years then, I began working on my other books and lecturing on that. And I kind of got away from the Nostradamus material. But one thing he did say, this evil man who was supposed to be the third Antichrist, he's supposed to come from the Middle East. We have his birth date. We have a drawing of him, and you're going to see it on the video. He said, this man would be the worst of all of them because he would study from Hitler, and he would learn from his mistakes. And this was where we were supposed to be by the beginning of the 2000s into this horrible war. And I like to think that maybe we took another turn and went into a lesser. We have the wars, but not the wars he saw. He saw horrible things. He also saw a lot of experiments that were being done with weaponry, and some of those are being developed by our own government. He, he had many quatrains dealing with AIDS, and he told us how that developed, and it was a government weapon. And I told my windows are going on, I said, I can't write this stuff. They're going to hang me from the highest tree. <laughs> but um, that was what I had to put together. But anyway, as he's going through all of this, he says, the Antichrist will eventually be defeated by the common, ordinary people. He called it the lice at his feet what he thought was insignificant. He mentions Agmios, who was an ancient Celtic uh, Hercules, who is the leader of the underground, who was supposed to come against the Antichrist. And I kept thinking, wondering if this was going to happen or not, but Nostradamus said the Antichrist has been predicted as far back as the Bible. He's the beast in a revelation, the beast with the number 666. And that deals with computers, and I'm also going to be going into that, too. But those are the... Uh, does, does she? Okay. Um, he said, this, this is why this was a man... This, if this was so horrible, we had to know about him so we could stop it from happening. But he said, the way that the history is going to go... The pendulum cannot swing all the way to the very evil man and stay there. It must swing back. And when it swings back, it's going to swing back to the time of the great genius, the wonderful man. And he said, at that time, you'll be living in the thousand years of peace that's mentioned in the Bible. It'll be the, the wonderful time of well, he said that the human body will be perfected to the point that it will never die. And we will have wonderful computer advances, and he didn't like computers. He was talking a lot about that. Uh, we'll be traveling in space, living in space. And he mentioned in the last half of volume one, he mentions all of the wonderful inventions and things that are going to be coming during the time of the great genius. So I like to kind of think that maybe we are skipping over the real bad times and going into the time of the great genius. Who's to say? But I want to bring you up to that part. 
Okay, Greg, I think we can play the video now. This was a show that was on Sci-Fi Channel. And I really liked the way they put it together, so I kept it and uh, abused it. Wars, man's landing on the moon, and the coming of a new antichrist. Was Nostradamus warning people of the inevitable, or was he giving us the power to change our fate? Nostradamus lived in the 1500s, a time of fear and superstition, when plagues ravished the earth and the church ruled the fate of people. He had visions of mankind's terrible future and its own destruction. Not unlike our time, many people then believed that his predictions were satanic. The church would put him to trial. That's him! That's Nostradamus! You were accused of the worst of all crimes, black magic, alchemy. Worship of the devil. He would continue his work, however, feeling that it was his duty to inform us of our fate so we could change it and create a better future for ourselves. His predictions that have come true. World War I and the beginning of communism. World War II, the rise of the Third Reich. Jewish massacres. The atom bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and natural disasters. He also predicted the advancement mankind would make, the invention of aircraft, the first landing on the moon, and man's constant search for answers in space. These advancements will not go without mistakes, disastrous mistakes, the Vietnam War, a war out of control, and the Challenger, a dream shattered. Dolores Cannon is the leading expert on the Nostradamus predictions today. In 1986, something unexpectedly happened to her. As a past life hypnotherapist, she conducted what she thought would be a normal past life regression. A patient went back to a past life when she was a male student of Nostradamus. Nostradamus spoke through this patient. I still have a hard time explaining what happened. He came through her and he said, I have an assignment for you. He could see that his prophecies were not being correctly interpreted. He said, the time is coming when they're going to come true. I have to warn people. If they keep on like this, they will destroy everything. Nature, themselves. Nostradamus gave Dolores the correct meanings of his predictions one by one. It took three years and 12 hypnotic subjects to complete the work. This was the first time that all Nostradamus's predictions have been translated. Almost a thousand. Nostradamus told Dolores Cannon to concentrate on the next 20 years. The 20th century will be especially terrible. Three wars must spread over the entire earth. And we have shown now that some of the prophecies have already begun to come true. In the world's history, thousands of people were killed by plagues, epidemics, illnesses with no cures. Not unlike our own time that has been struck with its own plague, AIDS. Nostradamus said that AIDS was a mutated disease, a form of rabies that originated from a monkey biting a woman who lived in Africa. The disease got into the blood mobiles and laboratories, contaminating biological products being made. AIDS will continue to spread worldwide. A cure is predicted about 15 years after the spread of this disease. The date of the Gulf War was given to Cannon long before it occurred. He said, you don't know how important this is. This is the beginning of everything. This is actually the beginning of the Third World War. This would instigate a few wars in the Middle East. The worst, however, is still to come. There would be one man behind the scene during all of this time. This is the third Antichrist. Nostradamus saw three Antichrists in the course of Earth's existence. Two were already predicted correctly, and we know them. Napoleon, Hitler. The third has already been born and said to be the worst of them all. Nostradamus wanted our time period to know about the third Antichrist, so something could be done to stop him. This last Antichrist is the same entity referred to in the book of Revelation as the beast with the number 666.
Nostradamus gave Dolores Cannon a detailed description of the third Antichrist and even a sketch drawing of him through the help of an artist. He was born on February the 4th, 1962, in Jerusalem. In 1987, he was a student at an Egyptian college specializing in computers, business and philosophy. Presently, he is in the background of everything that is happening in the Middle East. He is described by Nostradamus as an extremely handsome man with tremendous charisma. At first, he will appear as a savior and the man with all the answers. But he will be the opposite of what he appears to be. He will be the sheep in wolf's clothing. His work is secretly done now. How many of us know him already? There were more events predicted for our future that Nostradamus wanted us to be aware of. The Nazi party will slowly but surely return to power during the 90s. It will come to light that hurricanes are a man-made event brought about by scientists attempting to control the weather. The next two decades will mark the downfall of the Catholic Church. The Earth's continents will shift with the rising of the ocean's water levels. This could occur during the next four decades. These are just to mention a few. This all sounds like gloom and doom, but Nostradamus saw the amazing ability for the human being to adapt. We could handle the changes as long as they are occurring gradually, as they are now. Nostradamus also gave us a glimpse of a wonderful time to come. He saw a man whom he called the Great Genius, an important figure whose coming would balance out all the evil in the world. The great genius would invent great wonders and he would reign in the thousand years of peace when we would be traveling through the cosmos and living in space colonies. One question remains to be answered though. How could we explain all of this? I want to bring out a very important point that really shakes people up. In my work with him, he was most emphatic by saying you are not speaking to the dead when we are communicating. It's a concept of not simultaneous time, that there is no time. We look upon Nostradamus as a mystery, but as facts prove, he was an extraordinary human being with an extraordinary talent. Could we prepare ourselves for Armageddon? Nostradamus saw the end of the world, but he said it's so far in the future you don't need to worry about it. Cannon merely sees herself as a reporter with only the well-being of mankind at heart. Nostradamus said that people underestimate the power of their own minds. He said that it is up to us to change the world's fate and create a better future for ourselves. How could we possibly ignore this? Turn it off. Okay, turn it off, Greg. Okay. okay. But I did that about 10 years ago, I think. But one thing that's interesting in there, we did the stuff about AIDS, and I told them the real story of AIDS, that it was a government uh, weapon that was developed. And they said, we won't be able to get on the air with that. So they adapted it and changed it. That was the only part that they did change. But he saw it being developed as a weapon of war because they said you couldn't, um, it was supposed to have been like a germ warfare type of thing, but it got out of hand. It mutated and went over the edge. When that happened, there was no way the government or anybody else was ever going to take a, a, a responsibility for it. Now, what he said in there about the cure would be find it, found in 15 years that did happen. It was not exactly a cure, but from the time we did all of this and did the work, 15 years later, they had reduced AIDS down to where it was no longer in the top 10 killers of the world. They had found enough drugs to put it under control. So that, did, that part did come true. Another part in there where they talk about the weather control. There's a whole lot of net in the books about the government enveloping weapons where they can control the weather and influence the weather. And it makes you wonder with all the stuff that's happening, the hurricanes and things like that. 
And if you know anything about the HARP project, do you know about the HARP project? The one in Alaska. That they are experimenting with weather and experimenting with the uh, magnetic fields of the Earth. There's a lot going on that we aren't aware of. I don't know if you know about my radio show. I have a weekly radio show. And I have all these people on the show. And I do have the man who wrote the book, Don't Angels Don't Play This Harp. He was the one that exposed the whole thing. And we had him on the show. I wanted him to come and talk to this conference, but he couldn't get here this time. Maybe next year, anyway. He's got a lot of things that the government's doing that you really don't want to know. But... Um, the HARP project is another one of the weather uh, focusing machines. And so there's a lot of these things happening. So imagine when you're getting all this information, and it's pretty heavy stuff that I was receiving. And I didn't want it to, have, to believe it could happen, but then it begins to develop. I'm trying to think what else on there that has happened. Oh, definitely. Yeah, oh, he had the whole chapters and chapters on the Catholic Church. And... <laughs> I kept telling him, you're just wishful thinking, because he was being harassed by the Catholic Church during the time of the Inquisition. And I thought, that's all it is, you just don't like the, what you're living under. And he said, I do agree it's wishful thinking, but I'm only telling you what I see. And he kept saying the Catholic Church was built on sand, and it eventually would collapse. Interesting, the, what he said it would collapse from, he said it would collapse from within. And look what's happening with all the scandals that are happening. He said it would collapse from within. And it is being brought down. But he said in time now, as it begins to come down, religion will return to what it was supposed to be in the beginning. In my books in Jesus, you know, that was the way Jesus, uh, religion was supposed to be. And no one person over and everything telling people what to do Nobody making rules and regulations about sins. None of that was ever supposed to be in there. Uh, it's not in the Bible originally. And so he said it would all return to the way religion was supposed to be when Jesus set it up 2,000 years ago. When Jesus set it up, he called it the way. And it was supposed to be having meetings just like this and people in people's homes and people sharing their knowledge and their abilities, teaching each other how to heal, and all about love. That was what religion was supposed to be. And that's what Jesus taught when he was doing his uh, traveling. But man took everything and turned it around, changed it, and he ended up being crucified. He never understood what it was really all about. But Nostradamus said that religion will return the way it's supposed to be. So we're in for a whole wonderful thing when this, um, the great genius comes and we go into a whole new way of thinking. Yeah? I remember you writing about how one of the hosts would be assassinated and the next one would be poisoned and then the third one would be the downfall of the church. That'd be the last pope. And can you see how that passage comes through, how we take a different road? That's what I'm wondering. Can you hear her okay? Because we got the... the um, Okay, um, and we thought you know, nobody wants to come up to the mic, so um, she's talking about the predictions with the popes because he saw all of the popes, and he did see that in this time period would be the last of the popes, that there was going to be three, and the last one, when he was assassinated, that would be the downfall of the church. He called it the Pope of the Antichrist. But that's what I kept wondering. Some of these things have not come true. And I kept wondering, well, does this mean all of this is wrong? I don't believe so, because some of them have come true. Then I got to thinking a while ago, he kept telling me over and over again, she's got her hand up here too, he kept telling me, remember that nothing is set in stone. The future is not in stone. It's malleable. It can be changed by man. One decision can change an entire timeline. And he kept saying, I want you to tell people how they can change the future. Maybe 
we've done some good and we have changed it to where we're not following the worst case scenario. That's what I'd like to, like to think, and that was what was coming to me this afternoon. It's not that it's inaccurate. I'm glad that it hasn't happened the way he saw it because it was really horrible. Maybe it means we have turned a corner and are going into the time of the great genius and the, the wonderful things that he saw ahead of us. I like to think that. We don't want to have this war come. But he did say that the Antichrist had been seen since the Bible times. Does that mean he's still in the background and is just not being as effective or what? He had a lot about the, uh, the cabal. And I didn't even know what the cabal was when I was writing the books. It's the government behind the government. And he's got a great deal of, of prophecies dealing with that. And when I started lecturing on that, people were saying, you're talking about the Trilateral Commission, the um, Wilderbergers and the Rothschilds, and I didn't know any of that. But it was exactly what people had talked about, the government behind the governments all over the world. And he said they were descended from banking families going back hundreds and hundreds of years. And that now look at the banking things that are happening today. But this was the ones who were really controlling the governments. But see, a lot of these things, I really didn't want to know. <laughs> but <laughs> here that I had to go out and lecture on all of this. So it's, it was not what I wanted to do. But go ahead. As I see it, um, Pope John Paul was supposed to be assassinated. But again, we had choice. And he wasn't assassinated because people around the world, Catholics and not Catholics, prayed. And that could have been your assassinated pope. Because really, he was at death's door. You talk about the assassinating of the pope? I, see, I have, always have trouble understanding when somebody's with the micro. What is she? She's my translator. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> one. One, Use the microphone. One. Can you hear it? Yeah. Am I any less distorted? <laughs> okay, go ahead. When she sees it, what? Okay, that Pope, Pope John Paul was assassinated. He was supposed to die, but he didn't because of the prayers. Well, the one people. who uh, only had the short, uh, was only in there a month or so, Nostradamus said he was poisoned. And it was a poison that would uh, appear to be like a heart attack. And that then the next one coming in, they couldn't control him. And that was why they, uh, they poisoned him. But, you know, there was the one yeah, where he was supposed to have He was shot, wasn't he? And then he survived. So, you know, it takes all these twists and turns because he had many quatrains about the city by the junction of the rivers at the time when the roses bloom was supposed to be at the time that the Pope would be assassinated. And, uh, but some of these things have not happened. So, like I said, he sold us the worst case scenarios. Maybe we are avoiding it and we're going down the other road. Did he, did he ever say did what? what? <laughs> did he ever say what his name meant? Whose? Nostradamus. Whose name? Notre Dame. Did he ever say what his name meant? Well, Nostradamus was Michel de Notre Dame. Which means? Our Lady. Our Lady. Yeah. Interesting. But he was Jewish. He so was, was raised, she. He was raised with a <laughs> Jewish family. We, we found out more about his biography than anybody has ever known. He was Jewish, and he, the family had to convert to Catholicism, or they would have been killed or driven out of France. So they changed the Catholic because they had to, and Nostradamus was never happy about that either. But there was, uh, we learned a lot about his life and a lot about the conditions of that time that, it, to me, it was living history. But he also... Um, let me show this one piece here before I get into this other. Um, I have one little thing I want to show there. Let, let, me, let me say something first and then we'll show it. Okay, he saw a lot about computers. You gotta remember, this was happening in 1986. I got my first computer in 1985. 
And you know those kind, if you remember them with the MS-DOS, and <laughs> they were the very first computers. I, oh, I was just I was so afraid of that thing. I would be typing on it, type a chapter, and then I'd put it on save, and I'd go out of the room, and I couldn't stand to sit there, because sometimes it wouldn't save, it would destroy everything that I'd written. And I could see all these words floating out in cyberspace, you know. <laughs> and so I'd push the button, and then I'd get out of the room until it saved it. And I would print it out immediately, because I didn't know what it was going to eat the whole thing. So we didn't have much of a computer. This was the beginning. So here he's giving us information on computers. And he didn't like computers. He could see them. He said, man was giving up too much of his power to machines that we should be doing ourselves. And he didn't like it at all. But he saw the development of computers. And he saw the computers like we had. Then he saw computers that were going to be activated by voice. And you know, they are now. Then he saw computers that were going to be activated by thought. Well, in the last few years, this is happening because uh, the Japanese discovered it. They did it for handicapped people, but they made it to where all they had to do is think to the computer and it would turn itself on and off. They're making all kinds of machines do the same thing. Just by thinking at the computer, you can tell it what to do. And I think that's amazing because they said it doesn't matter what language you speak. The thought is the thing. Now, that's exactly how the ETs communicate. It has nothing to do with language. It has to do with thought. So they are kind of catching up with the ETs. But the Japanese have figured out how to do this by operating computers by thought. Now, this is going to catch on because it know it's going to spread. But the only problem is the government always turns these things around to weapons of war. But that he saw that development. Then he saw the final computers were the organic computers. This is the ones that the great genius would be using. He said it would be able to replicate itself and take care of itself. And I said, organic sounds like something that's living. He said, it definitely is. And when I began to do research on it, in those days, they had developed one that was operated with bacteria. And they said they could take a cube the size of a dice, and it would hold all the information in the Library of Congress. And then they've been experimenting since with proteins. They said they're making it to process it just the way the body processes DNA and processes information to the brain. It'll be a million times faster than any computer you're working with today. And it'll hold millions more information than you're doing today. And I've got a lot of information on this, articles and things that have been sent to me. They, in not too far in the future, a computer will be like nothing more than a bowl of water. It's how far in advanced it is. But look what they're doing with all of the electronics. Look how small they're getting. So the computers will be able to be organic, living. A little creepy. But when he was trying to explain all of this, you know, Brenda had no words for this. I didn't have any words for it because it didn't exist. And I kept thinking, here in 1985, I said, oh, yeah, maybe in 100 years, these things would come true. And five years, they began to be developed. Ten years, they were being developed. So he was, that's it, scary. He was way ahead of his time. Now, we're going to, yeah, he's got, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Before we're done, I'll tell you that. Okay, let me finish this thought first. He saw the World Wide Web before it was ever invented. He didn't have a name for it. Nobody did in those days. He saw it like the world with all of these strings and cords all wrapped all around the world. It was all like a mass of, of strings. And he said it would all be into a central computer somewhere that would control the whole entire thing. 
And when I was lecturing on that, some pl one place, somebody said, I think it was somewhere in Europe, they got a gigantic computer. It's called the Beast that is supposed to operate the entire system. But he described the World Wide Web exactly. Okay, Greg, put this one up here. Okay, this is something that one of my readers sent to me after the books came out. And usually when I show this, people want to write it down. This is numerology, and people say, that's not numerology. It's not the numerology as we know it. It's the numerology from thousands of years ago, the Chaldean Hebrew Kabbalah system of numerology. This woman tracked this down. World Wide Web reduces to 666, and WWW releases to 666. No matter how you break it down, it comes up to 666, World Wide Web. <laughs> I wonder if that was by accident or not. Because you know in the, in the book of Revelation, that's what it says, that 666 is the number of the beast. And if you, I quote it in the book because it talks about computers. That eventually nobody will be able to buy, sell, or do anything without the mark without the number. Everybody will have a number, which has happened, and we'll need that, and that's where they talk about the mark of the beast, and it goes back to 666. Who would have thought that? This came from a woman in Australia, I think it was. So, it's interesting. I wonder if they, when they come up with World Wide Web, if they knew numerology or not. Who the, knows? D Dolores, may I make a comment? In the Hebrew alphabet, the sixth letter is Vav, which is V or W. So V, V, V or Vav, Vav, Vav would be 666. One more time. Does that make, that make sense then? Exactly the same. Because I don't know that system. But people said it's not numerology. It's a different kind of numerology. OK, you can take it down now. Okay, But I think that's fascinating. That And thanks for uh, giving us that little bit of information there that you, because I know you are, you do know languages, and you think it is accurate then. But if, is it by accident, or did they know that when they were first in developing all of this? Who knows? What? <laughs> it makes you wonder, is anything coincidence or not? Okay, we've only got another 15 minutes. There you can see how there's so much with this. I, I talked for a long time. Okay, he was asking about 2012. Well, Nostradamus talked about the shifting of the world. He gave us the maps in, uh, convoluted, in uh, Conversations Volume 2 of what the world would look like. Because he said the world would not have to tilt, but just a little bit for the continents to start to shift and the tectonic plates to move. And once they began moving, they would displace a lot of water and there'd be a lot of flood, flooding. And continents would go down and continents would be pushed up. And there were some places, I ended up with maps of the entire world because I wanted that rather than just the United States. Some places he said, the, I said, I looked at these maps and I said, this doesn't make sense. I can see where mountains would be above water, but there are some parts of the United States that should not have been above water. He said that's because the tectonic plates will push against each other, force the, the, the land mass up as much as 1,000, 2,000 feet. This area is one that's going to be safe. It will be forced up over 1,000 feet. This, this area, isn't that weird? My son said, well, that means we're going to be okay, isn't it? I said, no, there'll be earthquakes. There'll be, oh, if you can hold on, I guess, there's all going to be all kinds of violent activity. But um, he describes the worst things you could imagine as the continents shift and as the increase in, um, oh, he did say, talking about the government controlling everything, he said, watch the weather. He said, first, there will be earthquakes where they've always occurred. Then there will be earthquakes where they've never occurred before. And he saw machinery that would be in airplanes and they would be beamed at the earth and can create earthquakes. Then he said, watch the ring of fire. 
the reawakening of the volcanoes. Some of them have been dormant for hundreds of years. All of these things have been happening during the 20 years that I've been working on this. And then he said the weather will become increasingly strange. In one of the quatrains, they call it mistake of the month. He said it would be areas that were normally cold would be hot and vice versa. There's several quatrains dealing with that. He talks about periods of drought. In one quatrain is the year without a rainbow, which he talks about the droughts. Then he talks about flooding. It's a great deal dealing with the weather. So all of this about the shifting of the earth, during that time I was getting phone calls and letters from people saying, should I move? Where should I move to? <laughs> I gotta get my son out of San Francisco. And I said, I can't tell you what to do, where to go. That's your responsibility. You, I said, just follow your instincts. You'll be where you're supposed to be. Follow your instincts. If you feel you should move, then move. If you feel you should stay, then stay. I know we're having a lot of increase of population moving into this area. And I don't know where they're getting these vibes or what it is, but definitely California's going down, Florida's going down, all of those areas. And so who's to say? But anyway, there's a great deal about the shifting of the earth. And I kept wondering about that. But then what I think is happening now, oh, in my books on the convoluted universe, you know, I'm getting into the, uh, the new earth, the changing of the vibrations and the frequencies as we move into the new earth. And they say we're going to leave the old earth behind. There's going to be two earths. Now, Annie's not in here, is she? Annie, are you here, Annie Kirkwood? Is she outside? Ask her to come in a minute. I always quote her, so let me see if she's... She, I haven't seen her in years, and I've always quoted her, <laughs> if she can remember the vision. But um, he talks about the shifting of the earth. She may not might be out there. Maybe she left her booth already. Annie, come up here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because he talks about the vibrations and the frequencies of the earth shifting and moving, and we will be going into a whole new earth. But there's going to be two Earths. And what I think, huh, I'm always quoting you. I said I might as well quote you with you sitting here. I'm so excited. <laughs> come on, sit down here for a minute. We're almost done anyway. Come over and sit down. We're almost done anyhow. Okay. Because okay. I quote you, and I'm going to make sure I got it right. Okay. Okay. But um, we're talking about the shifting of the Earth okay. and the two Earths and how they separate. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking this may be what Nostradamus was seeing because he kept seeing all this destruction and the, the violent things happening. I think that's the old earth. Yes, but the two, the two uh, are separating was a vision. That was that's what I want to talk about yeah. because in my lectures and in the books, I quote Annie. Now, if you know Annie Kirkwood, she wrote Mary's Message to the World. Remember that book? Long time ago. And it was very popular at the time. We were on panels together and doing lecturing everywhere. And this was in the beginning of the talk of the new earth and the yes. old earth. And it's very complicated to understand. So we were on this panel and you talked about your vision mm -hmm. where you saw the earth separating. Mm -hmm. Tell about that. I saw that. You remember the old Sherman uh, Williams commercial with the earth, the globe, and the and the uh, paint dripping down on it. I saw that globe, and then all of a sudden, the paint was gone, and it started pulling apart, almost like a chromosome does. A cell? I mean, the chromosome in the cell, where it pulls apart, and the strands are still holding on. And my sister does not believe in any of this, but I, in fact, she was quite upset because of all the things that were happening to me. And so when they started pulling apart, I heard her say, see there, everything that she said didn't come true because we're so okay. Because she was on one earth and I was on the other. The two separated into two separate balls. Yeah. And then you heard the ones over here 
Yeah, we hear we're saying, hey, it all happened just like we said it was going we to. Did we, it, really we did happy. it, we did it, we did it. We were real happy. Yeah. So. so that's why it's very complicated. It's hard to understand. It, it's very hard. It's still hard to understand. It's a little bit easier because we know more about cells and we hear the word cellular and all that, DNA. And we know that there's so much more that we don't know. We, we acknowledge that. But in the early 90s, that still was not acknowledged. And so it was very hard. And people thought I was speaking to the devil. I had lots of them tell me I was talking to the devil, that that was not Mary. And I can't prove it. So I asked her about it. And she said, we don't have to, you don't have to do anything about skeptics. I could come down and sit with them and talk to them, and they still wouldn't believe me. <laughs> But so. the idea of two Earths is yeah. really difficult for people to understand. And I'm still trying to explain that I'm writing about it, but that doesn't mean I have all the answers. He was asking about 2012, and what I'm getting, that's why I think the Nostradamus prophecies are not wrong. They're predicting the old Earth. Mm -hmm. Because they said those who stay with the old Earth will stay with what they created right. in the old Earth. And that's what that will be. They'll be in the disaster and, and the tsunamis and the earthquakes mm -hmm. and all of that. And we're moving into the new earth. And what I've been told, not with Nostradamus, but in my other work, is 2012 is the culmination. It doesn't mean that's the end. No. People are always saying it's the end of the world. Mm -hmm. It's the end of the world as we know it. But it's moving on. And by 2012, we're in the middle of it right now. And 2012 will be the culmination of it, when it all comes to the height. I like to think of 2012 as being the beginning. The beginning of everything. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, how do I know if I'm going or not? Well, I was told if you're interested in this at all, you're assured you're going. Mm -hmm. It's the ones who are still in the negativity. They're the ones, their vibration can't change that quickly. They'll be stuck with the old earth. So it's, it's going to be, we're living in a very exciting time. A lot of interesting things are happening right now. Also, if you think about uh, our bodies and how the cells divide and how we grow from two little cells, like two little entities that are a sperm and the ova, they get together and become one cell. And from that, we have evolved to where we are now, millions and millions of cells. And that same principle is the principle that God has used to uh, grow the universes, because there are more than one. Mm -hmm. and, and so, well, I tell people, too, mm -hmm. within your own body is a universe. Yeah. That's why you can heal yourself. That's mm -hmm. why you can control the diseases, because you, you talk to your body. You talk mm -hmm. to the cells. And when you do, you are the voice of God. And the body will listen, mm -hmm. because you have a universe within you. It's just coming to a different way of thinking. Yes, it is. But I'm always quoting you every time I talk about this, and I wanted you to make sure we got it correct anyway yeah, on that vision. Because I never, vision. It was a vision. I never forgot that vision, and it is in my book. Mm -hmm. I talk about it. And you, you want to take this? Uh, the amazing thing was when I was lecturing on this at one time, I think it was a conference in Laughlin, I don't remember, a man in the audience came up to me afterwards and he said, I've got to tell you this, I'm a businessman and this doesn't happen to me. But he says that I was quoting that vision you had with the earth pulling apart, said suddenly the auditorium disappeared, I was out in space, I saw it happening, just like that. So he went home and he recreated it on the computer. And he sent me his drawing of it. The one is just over the other. One is glowing. Mm -hmm. And so I, he said I could use it in the book as long as I didn't tell anybody what his name was. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it is in, I think it's convoluted too. We have that picture of that. So I don't know, truth is stranger than friction. Yes, yes. That's for sure. <laughs> OK. OK. I just. You, you want to go back? Are you okay? I'm okay. All right, we're almost done anyway. I'm okay. 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 Thanks for coming in.
Do you want me to go or you want me to say? We're almost done anyway. Just got a few more minutes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just like to confirm what you're saying from another tradition, which is the Mayan. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, passion in recent years has been the Mayan calendar. Yes, that's what I lecture on about 2012. And, they, and what I have discovered uh, is that there are two world trees. The old world tree, the new world tree. There were two creators, and we are the new world tree is being prepared, and little by little, those of us that are at that level of consciousness are moving into that second world tree. Okay, I only got part of that, but I do want to tell you, uh, in the book, I had regressions where people went back to the time of the Mayans. And you know, the Mayans disappeared. And there were Indian tribes, too, like the Anasaki that disappeared. I went back, these people went back to when they were there when this happened. So you know what happened? They evolved to the point they shifted. The whole civilization changed their vibration and frequency. They moved into this other dimension. But they could see the future. So they saw the next big event would be when the whole world shifted into the other dimension. And that's why they stopped their calendar at 2012. Because that was supposed to be when they saw it all happening to the world. So that's what 2012 means in the Mayan calendar. It uh, doesn't mean the end of the world. It means we're moving. And we're going to go the same play they did into another dimension. They said they uh, set the way for us to follow. So, I have some very fascinating regressions anyway. <laughs> okay, we just got a um, few more minutes. Yeah, who's back there? And Annie, yeah, this is the end uh, of, of you having, um, you know, communication with Virgin here. Mary, or are you going to continue? I, I don't understand. We can't understand it. Can she, uh, Julie, what is she saying? Yeah. But well, Julie is translating. This is for Annie. If she's wondering if you will be continuing your communication with uh, Mary. I have no idea if she comes to she wants. <laughs> and Dolores, one question. Oh, Annie is going to get back into lecturing again, and you said, yeah, I'm going to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> oh, when Byron died, she kind of put everything on hold. But now I think she said she's ready to start writing again and getting back into the flow. I think she's ready, don't you? She had a big and contribution. You can't just let it slide. You got more to do. And she's Dolores? Yeah? When I was talking to you last week, I remember you were talking that the computer are going to, you're just going to think and they will do, you know, through your thought. You know when you are saying that now? Well, Julie will tell us. Yeah. She's talking about when you said how the computer will work from your thoughts. But computers will work with what? Your what thoughts. You said about computers? What you said about computers? The thought, yeah. With the thought, okay. Yeah, the Japanese developed that, yeah. You yeah, remember in the regression that I was uh, driving a machine with my thought? Remember that? So that was really in old reincarnation. That was already made already before we came here. In your, her regression that you did with her, she was driving the car with thought, by thought. So they, it was already Well, they're already in doing that. it with planes, you know, the jet planes. Uh -huh. Have you heard about that? They said because the jet planes go so fast, they can't do it with controls. They're doing it with their mind. With their mind. Yeah. So we're on the way to that. It's happening. Yeah. They got somebody up here, Julie, that has a question, too. Okay, we just have two more questions and then we gotta stop. Yeah, go ahead. Dolores, do you have any information on Planet X? On what? Planet X. Planet X. Planet X, forget it. I know where the guy got the idea. He had a regression with me and there was never any Planet X mentioned, but he come up with the whole idea. Uh, no, the Planet X is supposed to be based on uh, Nibiru by Zachariah Sitchin. And in the Nostradamus books and even in the Jesus books, they saw another planet. We, it was actually 10 planets in the solar system 
One of them had an elliptical orbit. But uh, there never was any mention of disaster. It's just one that comes around every now and then. It doesn't mean there's any disaster with it. I wouldn't put any stock in it. Oh, you, know, you got the bike, okay? Yes. Did he say anything about autism in children? About what? Autism, autism in, children. in children. He didn't, but I can tell you a lot about it. <laughs> okay. Well, we're out of time. Okay. Um, I have a lot of doctors for clients, and they tell me things you don't want to know. And they have told me, Deb, they're getting out of medicine. They're going over into alternative healing and natural medicine. I work with alternative healing all over the world, especially in Russia. And these doctors have told me that the autism is definitely caused by the vaccinations and the shots. And there's one doctor that I've been working with who has curing autism. He said it can be cured. He has a clinic in Tennessee. And he said in one day can make the huge difference of following his treatments. It all has to do with diet. You gotta get that mercury and the stuff poisons out of the body and the child can be cured of autism. So a lot of people, if they're interested, we say call our office and the names are on our Rolodex of these doctors that we work with. There's a lot going on. I guess I'm stuck in the middle of it. <laughs> okay, I think we're run out of time. But, okay, thank you. It's a sign you're supposed to get back into it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>